As many of you already know, I really enjoy growing all sorts of unusual plants and fruits, which I find makes gardening even more fun and exciting. So today I wanted to share with you some of my favorites that I really like to grow, starting with one that looks a bit like fish eggs on the inside. <laughs> So these two trees here are called Australian finger limes. They're native to Australia and they're also known as caviar limes. They're very bizarre looking. They don't look like a lime that most people are used to, but they're one of the most satisfying fruits to open up. So I'll show you that in just a minute. But if you look at this tree here, it's looking very bushy. It does need a prune up and that's because it started to flower right when I wanted to prune it last. And the first couple of times that this tree did flower, it didn't actually produce any fruit. The flowers ended up dropping off. Even though the second time that it flowered, I went around with a paintbrush and just moved the pollen between flower to flower to try and hopefully get the fruits to take. But turns out those ones dropped off as well. And I think it was either the plant was too young or maybe it was the wrong time of year because a few months later it flowered a third time. I didn't do anything and they ended up finally producing a bunch of these finger limes, which is really cool. You can tell these are ripe when they're full and firm to the touch. And you can also see that these are starting to lighten up in color as well. When they're smaller and not ripe, they have more of a darker green skin. You can also tell that they're ripe by how easy they pull away from the plant. They should come away with pretty little amount of resistance. And you can see that there's quite a few that have just fallen on their own as well as they've ripened up. Anyway, let's open one of these up and give it a try. There we go. So on the inside, you can see that they've got these beautiful little beads of citrus juice. And the coolest part about them and the most satisfying part that I talked about is when you give them a squeeze, Look at that. You can see out of the top comes all of this beautiful sort of beads of citrus. Such an amazing looking fruit. Uh, but anyway, let's give it a try. The first thing you notice about these is definitely the texture. It's like crunchy little beads of lime juice bursting in your mouth. And they are very crunchy. You could probably hear me chewing on it. Such an intense flavor as well. They've got sort of a really citrusy lime flavor. It's quite sharp and there's also some sort of floral flavors in there as well. Uh, slightly sort of almost green uh, flavor. And what's cool is you can get these in different colors as well, like red ones, brown ones and green ones. You can use these fruits as a garnish on savory meals or on desserts or even in a cocktail, but I'm quite a lover of sour and tangy fruits. So I'll quite happily just sit here and eat these fresh. So these here are a type of pumpkin that originally occurred in Austria and they're mainly grown for the seeds because there's something really special about them. So if you open them up, the seeds are actually hullless, which means they're basically ready to go as soon as you cut them open, which we'll do very soon. They're called Styrian hullless pumpkins and you can grow these in much the same way as other pumpkins. I just stuck my seeds into some compost in the late spring. I watered them over the summer, let them kind of sprawl over the ground and then the fruits were ready to harvest in the autumn once the plants had fully died back. And they often have these green stripes on them, but those do slowly disappear as they get more sun. You do need around 100 days of warm growing season to get these to maturity. Why are pumpkins so hard to cut? <laughs> Let's just go for a transition. <laughs> Much easier. So as you can see in here, there's a bunch of these pepitas or seeds, which are full of really valuable nutrients. They are really slippery to try and hold, but I'll give it a try. Nice and smooth and nutty and so cool to eat straight out of the fruit. But one thing I like to do before I store the seeds to really increase their nutrition is to soak the seeds in water for a couple of days, which helps to break down the phytic acid in them, which is something that you find in lots of different seeds and nuts. And by breaking down this phytic acid, you're basically increasing your ability to better absorb the minerals in them. After a few days, I'm rinsing the seeds off and putting them in my dehydrator to dry. But before I had one of these, I just dried them on some paper towels on a drying rack, but it just takes a bit longer. The flesh is edible too, but it's usually not highly sought after like a lot of other pumpkins that are selected for being really tasty. You can eat raw pumpkins, by the way. <laughs> they don't really have much flavor, but I have heard of people roasting these up and using them in things like muffins and loaves. And I've even seen people juicing these and using them like that. But I thought today that I would make some Thai pumpkin soup because I figure when you use ingredients like spring onions, makrut lime leaves, as well as its zest, plus curry paste and coconut cream, that hopefully those will kind of really boost the flavors of the soup and the flavor of the pumpkin will be kind of less important, but we'll see how it is. 
With the seeds, you can put them in a pan and pop them a bit like popcorn, which makes them extra crunchy and tasty. And we use these as a garnish as well as some coriander and chili. But let's give it a try. Oh, got a big piece of chili. <laughs> All those Thai flavors in there are really good. And I did find myself like having to use more Thai flavors than usual, just to kind of make up for that pumpkin not having that much of its own flavor. So I think next time I'd probably add in another type of pumpkin into the mix, just to kind of give it a bit more of a pumpkin taste. But this is actually pretty nice. But just remember that the main reason to grow these are for the incredible seeds, which I reckon are great. But it has been nice just to get some use out of the whole fruit as well, especially, you know, with how expensive food is now. I'm a very passionate grower of feijoas, also known as pineapple guava. So these are fruit related to guavas. They are from South America, but they're really commonly grown here in New Zealand on these really beautiful evergreen trees. But they're not so commonly known in a lot of other places around the world, which is why I love sharing about these because they are one of my favorite fruits. So they grow these beautiful green oval shaped fruits and we put in a bunch of trees around two years ago and they've been producing just so many fruit this year. We've had a huge, huge amount of them to the point where we actually had to pull some of the fruits off before they were completely ripe because the trees were just getting too heavy in fruit and we didn't thin them out, which we probably should have. <laughs> but this is quite a large sized one. A typical Fijo that you would see is about that size there. And you can tell when these are ripe when they just fall and drop off the trees. You can even just give the tree like a gentle shake and any that fall off will be pretty much ripe but there's quite a few different varieties as well. So you get ones that have a more sort of rough, thick skin, others that have a smoother, thinner skin, and then the flavors and the textures of the fruit can vary as well from sort of sweet right through to more tart flavored ones, and the texture being more gritty or more smooth. So I haven't actually found a Fijoa variety that I don't like the taste of. The only time where I'm not so much of a fan of eating these is if they're overripe, or just not quite at the optimal ripeness for my preference. So that's something to keep in mind if you've tried them before and you didn't like them. It may also just be that they were too overripe or something like that. But anyway, to eat these, most people will just cut them in half, just like that. Get a spoon and kind of scoop them out like you would a kiwi fruit. The smell of these is very unique and very aromatic as well. It almost reminds me kind of of that really sweet smell that pineapples and strawberries have. Uh, but it is definitely very unique to Fijos. So let's give it a try. The way that I typically eat these is just to bite them in half. So just like that. And then pretty much just scrape out the flesh with my teeth. And I actually do eat some of the skin as well. The skin is fully edible. To me, these just have a perfect balance of sweet to tangy flavors, but it is hard to describe because it is quite a unique flavor. It's kind of just like it's Fijo flavor. That's what it tastes like, a Fijo. So if you didn't know, Fijo flowers are edible. And these are the flowers here. You can see they've got this red center, but the parts you eat are these little pink petals. And what happens is birds come along and they munch away on these petals, they pick them off. And in the meantime, they're spreading pollen from flower to flower and pollinating these plants, which is why you kind of want to keep them as a bit of an open shape to allow birds to kind of get all in there and pollinate them. And insects will help this process as well. But basically what you can do is just pick these off and eat them. And I tend to leave most of them for the birds, but I just like to pick off the odd one. And you can see that they've got this sort of thickened look to them. They're quite light in color and light pink. And that's the stage that you want to eat them at. If you let them kind of get a bit old and start to go a darker red, they're not quite as tender and juicy, but you do get to know and figure out which ones are the best to eat. Let's give it a try. It's kind of sweet and juicy and tender, and sometimes they do taste a little bit like Fijos themselves. Uh, that one didn't really, but what I find is the best time to eat them is in the mornings when the plants are really hydrated, particularly if you've had a heap of rain as well, they'll be a lot thicker and juicier and more tender. But yeah, kind of a cool little garden snack and a way to get something a little bit extra out of your feed jar trees. So this right here is a red banana passion fruit, also called vanilla passion fruit. And it is one that we're allowed to grow here in New Zealand, unlike the other species of banana passion fruit, which are listed as invasive. And these ones are native to the cool rainforests in Colombia. And what's cool is that because they are from those areas, they can handle slightly cooler temperatures than some of the other passion fruit species. But they don't do so well with heavy frosts or anything like that. 
So I've got this one growing up against my house. It's really the only place that I've got protection from wind and frost. But what I would love to do with these at some stage is grow them overhead because the flowers and the fruit form on these really long stems. And having them growing overhead would mean that the flowers and the fruit would drape down and just create a really beautiful display. The flowers are said to be pollinated by hummingbirds, which we don't have here in New Zealand. So I did some hand pollination to make sure they would set, and I had quite a few that did set, which is great. I did save two fruits to show you today, but I came out and one of them has been opened up and eaten, and they are hanging low down. I think it might have been a rabbit that came and done it, because I saw one hanging around the other day. So luckily, he did leave me one to show you, so let's go give it a taste. It smells really sweet and tropical, kind of like pineapple and passion fruit. So juicy. Wow. <laughs> Look at that, that looks like the most juiciest passion fruit I've ever seen. Beautiful colour, lots and lots of flesh in there. Mm. It's definitely a really juicy and really sweet tasting passion fruit and these are classed as one of the most delicious passion fruit varieties. I reckon they are. They are not as tangy as other types, definitely not. They've got a much sweeter flavour and the sort of excess juice in there is kind of reminds me, it's quite nectary, almost like mango flavours uh, mixed with passion fruit. Uh, but it does have a lot more sweetness than uh, some other passion fruit varieties that I've tried, which are more sort of tart flavours but a very, very nice passion fruit. You can grow these really easily from seed, which is how I grew my ones, and you can grow them from cuttings as well. But, you know, from seed, it's definitely an easy thing to do. They grow really quickly anyway, and they produce fruit fairly quickly as well, easily within the first two years. I hope you found this interesting and that it's encouraged you to have a go at growing something a little bit different in your garden. But let me know what your favorite <laughs> thing to grow is that's unusual. Um, and feel free to check out one of these videos over here. I'm getting circled by turkeys, but I hope you have a great day and I'll see you in the next one. Go, go.